We are in a series that we have entitled uh, Christmas in July because we're talking about spiritual gifts. If I get a gift for Christmas, I can't wait to open it up and understand what it's about. And hopefully you'll feel that way today as we talk some more about spiritual gifts. Man, I can't wait to see what God has in store for me. So I hope you have your message notes with you. If you do, you'll find we're going to cover some ground. We've covered the last three weeks. A lot of people have been traveling on vacation things. So let me summarize where we've been. Paul instructed the Christians in Corinth about spiritual gifts and how to use them. Here's what he wrote in 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding the question you had about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand or be ignorant about this. Um, the Holy Spirit gives us special abilities so we can be Christians in the culture where we are. Uh, somebody asked me yesterday, hey, what I thought about the opening ceremonies, the Olympics, where you had some people in Paris, you know, they were, they were cross-dressing men that were portraying the Last Supper of Christ, and it was really disrespectful and, uh, you know, and just something that is just shocking. Well, I told them this in 2 Peter 3, the apostle, I mean, the apostle Peter wrote this. He said, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. People scoff at Christianity. Maybe you haven't noticed that on the internet yet. But in the last days, if you think Jesus is going to come soon, you're right. We are 2,000 years closer to his return than when this book was written. And when you start seeing the stuff you saw in Paris, man, that should awaken us. It's like, hey, if, if Jesus is coming soon, that doesn't mean we all sit there and go, okay, well, let's get our Bible and see if we can figure out numerical codes as to what time of day and what moon sign there would be and when he's going to come back. That's not what Jesus told his disciples to be doing. He said, it would be good for you when I return to be busy doing the things I told you to do. You know what he told us to do? to make disciples, to tell people about Jesus, to serve others and to love them and to win as many people as we can to Christ. That's what we want to do here at Centerpoint. And boy, oh boy, when I see something like that happen in the Olympics, I go, oh man, I need to pray about this. And by the way, what a great lead into what we're talking about today, because the Christians living in Corinth lived in a place exactly like that. These were Christians who'd come from a really pagan place. The temple to the goddess Aphrodite was located there. A thousand temple prostitutes, male and female. If you were a sailor, the slogan was that if you stop in that port, not every sailor can handle a trip to Corinth. Now, if you're some country boy, this is going to blow your circuits. This is wickedness at a whole new level and immorality. Well, it seems like we live in a world that's doing the same thing. Peter said, hey, in the last days, scoffers are going to come. That doesn't stop us from doing our mission. In fact, it reminds us that's why we're here. I mean, I hope when you see things like that, you pray for the people in Paris. Did you know there are many committed Christians who went to Paris just to be, just to pray and to be evangelistic witnesses there? Did you know that? That's happening right now. We should pray for them, not just shake our heads. It is offensive. It's terribly offensive to me. But at the same time, Jesus came to save lost sinners and that's what we need to pray about. The apostle Paul told the Christians in Corinth, this is why the Holy Spirit gives you spiritual gifts. So you can reach people like that. Now, if you want to hear more about that and that kind of gift, that's how we're supposed to use them. Then I got a message for you today. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, I just want us to be a real church, just like they were in Corinth. We have spiritual gifts. You've given us gifts so we can reach the culture and the people in our time. They had to reach the people in their city in their time well, this is ours. And Lord, it won't do just to shake our heads and say, I wish there was some hope for them. There is hope for them in Jesus. But how will they hear if no one tells them? How is they going to tell them if nobody sends them? How are we going to send them if we're not willing to even pray for them? So Lord, you got to make this clear to us. This is our time in this world right now to be salt and light. And I pray that today's message will help us do that. I want you to speak, Lord. Move me out of the way. That's what I'm asking. Say whatever you want said to us today. In the wonderful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So, dear brothers, don't want you to be ignorant about this. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to do what God told us to do, to be witnesses all over the world. Now, let me summarize this. That spiritual gifts are more than natural skills and abilities. We all have natural skills and abilities. Some of us can cook well, and some of us are artists, and some can sing, and 
Some of us not so well, but that's another story. Anyway, um, they are supernatural. They're to a much greater extent than would be possible in our own strength. And over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about a number of spiritual gifts. I just wrote them all out on one sheet. And, you know, you can go home and look all these up if you want. But there's just a few verses where in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul wrote these first three. And Peter had a couple more. But, but three lists here. But the idea is that these are all gifts that God gives us so the church can function. And Paul talks about them in 1 Corinthians 12 and in 13. And now we're going to talk in 1 Corinthians 14 a little more. But Paul introduces all of these gifts to us. And Peter adds on, like I said, and so that we can know, hey, uh, the Holy Spirit uses lots of different people to do lots of different things. Here are some things that we want to talk about that we've already hit. So this is just by review if you've been traveling. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. So that's why there's so many of them. Um, There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. There are people who are apostles. That's a missionary, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher. There's all kinds of different ministries, ministries, different countries, different ages, all that. But the, the Holy Spirit gives gifts for all those. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. He gives this so we can help each other. That's why he gives the gifts. It's the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. We don't go shop for these. We don't pay for these. There's no Walmart where we go get the spiritual gift aisle at Walmart. Okay, where you get this. You don't do that. The, the Lord gives these, and sometimes it's hilarious when people discover they have a gift, like leading. All of a sudden, they're challenged to lead a connect group, and they've never led one before. I've never done that before. And they try it, and they're really good at it. They say, I'm really good at this. And I go, I know. The Lord's helping you. They go, wow, that's crazy. I mean, when we started this church, people said, how are you going to get all the leaders for this church? Where are they going to come from? I go, oh, I don't know. The Lord's going to bring them in. And he still does. And he still does. If that's good news to you, would you say amen? amen. Good, because some of you are those leaders you hadn't tapped yet, okay? <laughs> oh, take that back. Okay, but, but the idea is he's going to call us to things maybe we've never done before. Mm. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. We each have a spiritual gift here. All of us do. Maybe more than one. We do. You may never have thought of that. Hope today to remind you of that. And are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. I mean, the whole idea is so we can help each other. So we don't, none of us have all of these gifts. None. We each have one or two, maybe a couple more. I don't know. But none of us, and there's not one gift that everybody has. Not everybody's not a preacher. Everybody's not an evangelist, for instance. That's not the way it is. So God rigged it so we have to love each other and work with each other. And now you know why last week, Shane, when he talked about 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter right before this, said, hey, you guys need to love each other. Because you see, when we learn to use our gifts together, I mean, that's, we're people. And when we struggle, we use our gifts together together. We're going to disappoint each other. We're going to let each other down. Sometimes we're going to hurt each other's feelings. So we're going to forgive each other and bear with each other and pray for one another. Welcome to the Bible. This is what it's talking about. So when Paul was writing the Corinthians, he said, look, you guys live in a sinful, wicked place. But here's the good news. The Holy Spirit will empower you. He'll give you the desire and the power to do what God wants you to do. And he's going to give you all these gifts but they're all assorted among you here. And as you work together and you figure this out, you need to learn to work together and cooperate to make the most of your gifts. Now, with that in mind, I told you there that Paul had been writing to the Corinthians. He said about a question. Well, apparently, this is point B on your notes. The Corinthian Christians were confused about how to use the spiritual gifts of prophecy and speaking in tongues in their worship services. We went through a bunch of these, li- these gifts a couple weeks ago, and I hope you go back online and look at that. But when it comes to the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy, I wanted to spend some more time because Paul spends a whole chapter here, chapter 14 in this letter, um, talking about this. So let me remind you that prophecy is the special ability. Remember, it's a special ability. It's not just 
uh, somebody has a, a good idea about something, it's a special ability to clearly communicate and persuasively declare God's will regarding a situation, an issue, a person, a group, or even the future. God has revealed something and wants you to communicate it. And so that can happen sometimes. Part of what happens here on Sunday mornings, I'm certainly teaching, and I feel like God has given me a gift of teaching, but sometimes there's a prophetic part of this too, where it becomes very clear that God is speaking something that people need to hear. I know this because they will come and they will visit with a friend and they'll go, okay, I visit your church three times. Each time I come, that guy is talking directly to me. How is that possible? And he's a stalker. No, he's not. No. <laughs> the idea is that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. That there's something that needs to change or there's something you need to do more of, either encouraging you or um, giving you confidence in something, or maybe even reprimanding you. Hey, this, is, this isn't the way you need to go. But saying, hey, there's a better way. And you'll see that as we go through this. That's prophecy. Tongues, on the other hand, is a special ability to speak in languages not previously known or studied. So don't get thrown off by the word tongues. Tongues just means language. So, like, I, that's my native tongue. I mean, English is my native tongue, even though I live in Alabama, and some people would de debate that, okay, that English is my native tongue. But my point is, is that interpretation of tongues is the special ability to interpret what a person speaking in tongues is saying. So if somebody is speaking in a language that nobody understands or that nobody has learned before, then there's somebody who can interpret that, and that would be supernatural as well. So... The Corinthians were struggling with this because apparently they were having meetings where when they'd get together with a worship service like this, there'd be some people that'd be trying to say, hey, I got a message from the Lord, a word of prophecy. There'd be people who want to sing. There'd be other people speaking in tongues and their meeting was turned into chaos. That's what you get the idea from. And you'll see as we read through this. So that's why Paul also said, hey, look, there's lots of different gifts, but let love be your highest goal. Can we say that together, please? Let love be your highest goal. One more time. Let love be your highest goal. Not your highest goal to be the most prominent teacher in America. Not your highest goal to be the best evangelist. Not your highest goal to be a person who's known for their great faith. None of that. That's not what he says. Love needs to be the highest goal. Because that's when we forgive each other. We're patient with each other. And we take responsibility for ourselves. This requires a lot of maturity here. But you should also desire, he says, look, love is your highest goal, but you should desire these gifts. This is how we're going to get the job done. But you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, just what we've been talking about. And especially the ability to prophesy, to declare clearly what God's will is. And this could come after you've spent a lot of time in prayer about something for someone and you spent time in the Word and it's become crystal clear. This is something, and, I'm, and then you write a heartfelt note to somebody, I love you, and I just, this could be one of your kids or a neighbor, and this is what I believe God would want you to know. And if God puts a burning message on your heart like that, and people sometimes write mean notes about our church that way, or they write other people notes about this, and they go, I got a note from a friend, and I just feel like, man, this just went, whew. it really struck me. Okay, that's prophecy. He goes, really, especially the ability to prophesy, for if you, have that ability, if, if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You'll be speaking the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But the one who prophesies, uh, he strengthens others. <coughs> he encourages them and he comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks in a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. I wish you all could speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could prophesy. So here's what's happening. The Holy Spirit gives some people the gift of prophecy where they can clearly proclaim a message. Like I said, I... I experience this sometimes when I, I know when I'm working on an outline here, I, I know this is a word that God wants me to share with all y'all. I know it. He's just convinced me of that. And when I share it, it's like people go, ooh, man, I really needed to hear that today. Praise God. So I experienced that part of it from time to time. I've never experienced the gift of tongues. But the um, people I know who have the gift of tongues, let me tell you what they experience. They experience being able to praise God in a language they don't know. That's why Paul said, he said, when you uh, speak in tongues, you'll be speaking only to God since people won't understand you. I mean, if you're wondering, well, 
what, what does that look like? Well, let me tell you a couple of places in scripture just to introduce the whole concept of it. Uh, and this is not in your outline, but this is from Acts 2. Just listen. On the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, all the believers were meeting together in one place in Jerusalem. Jesus had told them, Jesus had appeared to the disciples for 40 days after he rose from the dead. So for the, about 10 days, they'd been meeting and praying. He told them to wait in Jerusalem until they received the Holy Spirit. This is when this happened, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roar of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where the believers were sitting. And then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them on top of their heads. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. They were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. And they stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, ah, they're all drunk, that's all. So from the very beginning, the whole understanding of the gift of tongues has been divided into two camps. People say that's amazing and wonderful, or they're all just a bunch of drunks and they're, they're faking it. From the very beginning, when it was given. We still live in a world, when people talk about this, when people have the, when the Holy Spirit gives them the gift of being able to praise him and pray to him in languages they don't know, People think, some people think it's all made up, it's all a sham, it's all a scam. And other people say, this is a wonderful thing. But even that can go to the place where people say, everybody has to speak in tongues or you're not a Christian. And so today, I just want to tell you what Paul said about it. Because we carry things to extremes all the time. And we fight over things. And we, like we talked about, Jesus is coming soon. And Paul just wants us to know, hey, this is the way we can work together on this. It also happened in Acts 10, just listen to this, Peter uh, was sent to the home of a Roman soldier by the name of Cornelius. An angel had appeared to Cornelius and told him to send for Peter. He'd tell him all about how to have a right relationship with Jesus. So Cornelius sent for Peter, he came, and uh, Cornelius had all his friends and family at his house, and when Peter presented the gospel to him, this is what happened. Even as Peter was saying these things, telling about Jesus, the Holy Spirit fell on all Cornelius and all his friends, all who were listening to the message. And the Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out to the Gentiles too, for they heard them speaking other tongues and praising God. What's interesting here, I just want to point this out. I read this to you a little bit ago. When you speak in tongues, you're talking to God. You're not talking to people. Because if you're talking a language they don't know, they wouldn't understand. There are gifts for talking to other people, teaching, speaking, preaching, evangelism, prophecy. Those are gifts for talking to others. Tongues is a gift for talking to God. It's a gift of, a special gift of praise that he gives people. So on Pentecost Sunday, when the disciples were speaking in languages, the people heard them praising God. They weren't evangelizing in other languages. That's not what was happening. Peter gave the evangelistic message. But that was a language that was there was a common tongue that all of them were speaking. Peter was speaking the common tongue of the day. When he went to Cornelius' house, he wasn't speaking a lot of languages. He was doing this, but he heard the Jewish people there who knew multiple languages heard people praising God, and these people wouldn't have even known those languages. And how would they know to praise God? These were Gentiles. These weren't people who'd grown up with all the scriptures like they had. So this is supernatural, beyond what anybody could do in their own. And that's what tongues is. It's a supernatural access to language. Let me read some more and I'll explain some more here. He goes on and he says, uh, I wish you all could speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you're saying so the whole church will be strengthened. Dear brothers and sisters, if I should come to you speaking in an unknown language, how would that help you? But if I bring you a revelation or some special knowledge or prophecy or teaching, that will be helpful. Even lifeless instruments like the flute or the harp must play the notes clearly or no one will recognize the melody. And if the bugler doesn't sound a clear call, how will the soldiers know they're being called to battle? It's the same for you. 
If you speak to people words they don't, in words they don't understand, how will they know what you're saying? You might as well be talking to an empty room or an empty space. There are many different languages in the world, and every language has meaning, but if I don't understand a language, it'll be, I will be a foreigner to someone who speaks it, and one who speaks it will be a foreigner to me. And the same is true for you. Since you're eager to have the special abilities the Spirit gives, seek those that will strengthen the whole church. That's what he's saying. So anyone who speaks in tongues should pray also for the ability to interpret what has been said. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. Well, then what should I do? I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll pray in the spirit, and I'll also pray in words I understand. I'll sing in the spirit, and I'll also sing in words I understand. For if you praise God only in the spirit, how can those who don't understand you praise God along with you? How can they join you in giving thanks when they don't understand what you're saying? You will be giving thanks very well, but it won't strengthen the people who hear it, hear you. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. But in a church meeting, I'd rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. So all these instructions come back to our church meetings here. When a person praises God in an unknown tongue, they're given the ability to praise God beyond the limits of human speech. You go, what? Well, you know, God is beyond the limits. We can praise him, right? He's infinite. There was a song written by um, Stephen Curtis Chapman and Jeff Moore about 30 years ago. It's called Listen to Our Hearts. They tried to talk about how impossible it is to praise God using human speech. How do you explain, how do you describe a love that goes from east to west and runs as deep as it is wide? Lord, you know all our hopes, you know all our fears, and words cannot express the love we feel, but we long for you to hear. So listen to our hearts, hear our spirits sing, a song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are, but words are not enough to tell you of our love. So listen to our hearts. And the beginning of second verse, I won't go through all the whole song here. If words could fall like rain from these lips of mine, and if I had a thousand years, I'd still run out of time. I hope you understand, you and I can praise God. We can sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. If you wanted to praise God for how, how intelligent he is, how powerful he is, how amazingly loving he is, how he orchestrates all things together, we could spend an eternity praising him and never begin. Human speech is limited. But what if some of us were given the ability to speak in languages we hadn't learned that take praise to a whole nother level? The pastor friends of mine, the friends of mine who love the Lord, love the Bible, they know Christ, they tell me this is what it's like when they speak in tongues. When they are speaking in tongues and praying in tongues, praising the Lord, they said they just have an absolute sense the Lord is all over them. He is there in his presence. He's given them power and peace and joy. And it empowers them to go out and do whatever else he has commanded them to do. And Paul says, I wish everybody could have that. But he said, but, but understand this. If you exercise that gift where you're speaking a language you didn't know and you don't understand, well, the person next to you doesn't get it either. And so if you came in a meeting and everybody's doing this, it's just it's chaotic. And apparently that's what they were doing. And he also said, he acknowledged the fact, he said, look, the reason I want you to speak in tongues, I wish everybody could, is because it builds you up. It, it edifies you. In fact, that's a bullet point on your outline here that Paul wished all of us could speak in tongues because people with this gift are built up. In some translations, it's edified. That's a construction term. I mean, edifice is something you build. Edified is being built up. And so people are built up this way. And when they're, when they're doing this, why would you not want that? Well, you do. But Paul says, but you don't want to exercise that when you have a room full of people like we have here where nobody knows what's going on. It's just confusing. Well, what's a parallel to that? Well, a parallel would be this. If I have a personal devotion at home, and we want you to, we would love, in fact, we have a new members class that's going on. With Shane Seegers teaches classes about how to have a daily devotional time and things. Your daily devotional time, my daily devotional time, we want everybody to read from the Bible on their own, to pray on their own, to get to a quiet place and grow because it'll build you up. You'll be edified when you have a daily devotional time. 
But wouldn't you think it's strange if we invited you in on Sunday morning and we told you all to go to different places and then you all were just having your own quiet time reading from different places of the Bible and then you just left? Go, why did we come here? Why didn't we do that at home? That's what he's talking about. That's not the right place. There's lots of gifts, but he said, you don't need to use all of them at the same meeting at the same time. There's lots of gifts here. We've gone over in this series about the gift of serving. We have people using the gift of serving this morning, serving coffee and serving snacks when people come in. We do it to make people feel welcome. It's part of hospitality. We always want people to feel welcome here. I love that. I'm glad we have people doing that. I just don't want them to do it while I'm talking. Peanuts, peanuts, coffee, coffee, snack here. Don't do that while I'm trying to present a message here. But I have the gift of serving. I have to use it right now. No, you don't. No, you don't. Somebody has a gift of giving right in the middle of the message. I want to make my donation to the church. Well, first of all, how much is it? No, I wouldn't do that. No, no. <laughs> no. I want to make a donation right now. Well, no, we just told you there's an app. We passed the buckets. You can do that. You can give after the service. You don't have to do it in the middle. We don't have to exercise every gift at the same time. Does this make sense to everyone? Paul wanted even more, he wished even more that all of us could prophesy because the gift builds up the whole church. He's talking about large group meetings. But man, he says, I wish everybody could speak in tongues because, I mean, to be able to praise God at a level that exceeds human speech, how wonderful is that? Hmm. Next thing Paul reminded the Corinthians was that giftedness is not the same as maturity. Giftedness does not equal maturity. Can we say that together? Giftedness does not equal maturity. You could have a 12-year-old who's a genius and going to college. You could. We've all read stories of such brilliant children, extremely gifted. We even call them gifted students. They are gifted. Are they mature physically? No. Are they mature emotionally? No. Are they mature spiritually? No. But they're gifted. You could have a gifted athlete. Does that mean that that gifted athlete is mature with his or her money? No. Does that even mean they're mature when it comes to being a team player? No. So maturity and giftedness are different. Elsewhere in the Bible, Paul instructs that Hey, be slow to appoint people to positions of leadership, even if they're gifted, because they can become prideful because they're not mature yet. <laughs> Dear brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your understanding of these things. Knowing when to use a gift at the appropriate time under the direction of the Lord so it fits together with all the other gifts requires maturity. That's what Paul's talking about. Be innocent as babies when it comes to evil, but mature in your understanding of matters of this kind. If unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your church meeting and hear everyone speaking an unknown language, they'll think you're crazy. Well, they would. The same way if they, we put everybody in corners and we handed out devotional guides and everybody's having their own devotional time. It's like, what are you doing? Well, we're just getting everybody built up individually. Well, one. Why would you do that here? Okay, and this is what he's talking about. But if all of you are prophesying and unbelievers or people don't understand these things come into your meeting, they'll be convicted of sin, judged by what you say, and as they listen, their secret thoughts, thoughts will be exposed. Then they'll fall to their knees, worship God. God is truly here among you. So the whole idea is that we want to do things in such a way that we can help people. Some things for large group meetings, some things for private and God gifts us that way. So a couple of life applications. God wants us to be good stewards of our spiritual gifts, just like he wants us to be good stewards of everything else he gives us. He gives us money. He gives us family. He gives us career. He gives us the ability. He gives us strength, opportunities. He gives us all these things. And at the end of our lives, what we want to hear when we get to heaven is this, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you many, many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. This is what God wants for us. A second life application is this. We want to do everything we can to equip ordinary people to serve their communities, share the good news of Christ, and gather for worship wherever God leads. That's our vision statement. It's, 
out on the wall next to the water fountain in the lobby. So if you've read that, I've read that before. I hope so. We want to equip ordinary people and help them, help you, help me discover how we can work together with the gifts God's given us. Some of us have one gift, some another. Some of us have multiple gifts. And God wants that so much for us. And so Paul says, hey, look, if you have somebody who can interpret the speaking of tongues, then share that in the large group meeting. I have some pastor friends. They speak in tongues all the time in their daily devotional life. But when they're teaching in front, they, when they've even taught on this passage, it's funny. You talk to them. They go, yeah, well, I, I explained to my church. I said, well, if I stood up here and talked to you in a language you didn't understand, you go, what are you doing? I don't understand what you just said. And that's why Paul was saying, look, I'd rather speak five understandable words in a large group than 10,000 in an unknown language. We want to do everything we can to bring people in. Listen to Acts 15. Um, Peter, I mean, Paul and Barnabas were brought before a council in Jerusalem. They'd gone out and started churches all over the place among Gentiles. And there were people saying, well, the Gentiles all have to be circumcised and observe, observe Jewish, Old Testament Jewish laws. And James, the half-brother of Jesus, said this. He said, no. He said, in my judgment, we shouldn't make it difficult for the Gentiles are turning to God. That's why we use a translation that's easy to understand in here. We're not trying to make it difficult. That's why the scripture is on the screen and we hand it out to you. And, and, we, and I'm trying to give you lots of examples. We want to talk to you so you and I can embrace this. We don't have a dress code. I did a funeral for a guy just yesterday. He's passed away at 80, but the last couple of years of his life, his wife said that was the best years they ever had going to church. They found center point and she said that it was just amazing. He couldn't wait to go to church. He'd never done that in his life. She said at 4 o'clock on Saturday afternoons, he's have his clothes laid out on the bed for, next Saturday, for Sunday morning. We're going to be on time. And then she said the crazy thing is we didn't go to 11, till 11. Anyway, <laughs> but, but he wanted to be ready for 11. But, but the point was, she said it was just so much fun because they had never done this before. They'd come home at, or they'd go to lunch somewhere and they would discuss all the life application points. And you go, I just, I love coming to this church because I love, I get greeted and people make me feel so welcome and everybody can be here. And I feel like God is speaking to me and I feel like this whole thing, I, I'm a part of, I'm a part of the whole body here. Can I tell you that's what we want? It's why we do small groups. We want you to be a part of uh, some people who know your name. We want you to read your Bible. We want you to be equipped in all these things. And we have people with all these gifts. We need them all. Mm. In Hebrews 10, 24, it also says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. That's what you've seen here, us considering how do we do that. We've considered it a lot. And if you have questions, please fill out the Connect card. We'll get back to you on this, how you can get involved. Last point, Paul reminded the Corinthians that they were reflecting the nature of God to their community when they conducted their meetings properly and in order. He said, I'm not mad that you have spiritual gifts. I'm glad you're using them, but let's just use them together. You're fighting each other here because you're not coordinated. So he gave some guidelines here. He said, well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, one's going to sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given. One will speak in tongues, another will interpret what's said. But everything that's done must strengthen all of you. No more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time, and someone must interpret what they say. But if no one's present who can interpret, they must be silent in your church meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. This is what we've been talking about. Let two or three people prophesy, and let the others evaluate what's said. But if someone is prophesying and another person receives a revelation from the Lord, the one who is speaking must stop, and in this way all who prophesy will have a turn to speak one after the other, so everyone will learn and be encouraged. Remember, the people who prophesy are in control of their spirit, and they can take turns. Paul says, you have these gifts, you can control them. You can. You can wait, and if nobody's there to interpret, you can do this at home. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the meetings of God's holy people. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. Don't forbid speaking in tongues, but be sure that everything's done properly and in order. Those are his instructions. Because time is running out. Jesus is coming soon. This is urgent. God has given us his Holy Spirit so we can get the work done. He's given us gifts and we need to work together. 
now. And if there was any word of the Lord for you this morning, I just want to encourage you, don't be afraid to step out in faith. Maybe, he, maybe your heart was thumping when I talked about leading because you go, oh my goodness, I think God might want me to lead a small group, but I've never done that before. Well, try it. Don't be afraid. If you need the gift to do that, if he's calling you to do it, he'll give you the desire and the power to do it. If this is good news, would you say amen? amen. Life application, a couple things real quickly. We, we use the Bible to evaluate everything that is said in our meetings because the Bible is truth. I want you to understand, that's why everything we've talked about in here came straight out of the Bible. This isn't my thinking on it. This is God's word. God's word is truth. The night before he was crucified, Jesus prayed this for his disciples. Father, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. God knows what's going on in Paris. God knew what was going on in Corinth. I'm not asking you to take the people of Center Point out of a sinful world. I'm asking instead you'd keep them safe from the devil. They don't belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. And we've been looking. All of these are passages in the word. This is truth. He expects us to work together and seek his guidance on this. One last life application. Church is not about me. Philippians 2 says this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests but each of you to the interests of others. <coughs> I mean, the Lord moves in amazing ways. I don't want us to be afraid to pray for people and to pray for healing, but it would take a miracle. What if God wants to do a miracle? I don't want us to be a, if God gives you the gift of tongues, I want you to be able to use them and use them confidently. That you're, this is something to celebrate. This is a wonderful gift from the Lord. And we will never forbid that here. But I want us to embrace whatever gift he's given us and make the most of it and encourage each other in this. Will you pray with me? Lord, I want to thank you that you give us spiritual gifts. I want to thank you that, Lord, today we've had a chance to look at a few verses of scripture. Lord, I don't want us to be afraid to follow you. You'll give us the desire and the power to do what you call us to do. You'll give us the gifts we need, even gifts that we didn't know we had. If the Lord spoke to you about something today, open your eyes to something you never thought about before. Just silent where you are. Would you just say, Lord, I heard you. I heard you. Lord, let us be your servants in a world that is desperately in need of a savior. Help us do more than shake our heads when we see sin in the world. Remind us to pray. You put the Corinthians right where they were. You put us right where we are. Show us how to work together. Give us the love we need, the ability to cooperate so we can be the church you want us to be. Wonderful name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen.